and welcome to Arcadia University's Histology course. Uh, today's lecture is on the nervous tissues and in part one of this lecture we're going to take a look at general characteristics associated with uh, the nervous system. Uh, as with all of these lectures it's important to go through and review the objectives uh, for this lecture. Uh, this will provide you with an opportunity to see uh, what are the important concepts associated with the lectures uh, as well as to use these as uh, possible study focusing questions. So if we take a look at nervous tissues, again keep in mind that as we're talking about tissues in general, uh, there are four basic tissue types. Uh, we've got epithelial cells, which are uh, epithelial tissues where the cells are close proximity to one another. We've got the connective tissues that we just finished up with, and the connective tissues, we've got cells that are scattered and in the intervening space, we've got um, that extracellular matrix, uh, the fibers and the ground substance. And now we're gonna look at the, the last two tissue types. The first are gonna be the nervous tissues, uh, and then the next lecture, we're gonna take a look at uh, the muscular tissues. But we're basically looking at, with the nervous tissues and the muscular tissues, cells that are functionally similar to one another and that they're gonna be able to respond in some way. And so for the nervous tissues, we're gonna be looking at cells that are capable of transmitting electrical chemical signals. And so they're gonna be important for controlling the activity within the body and signaling different regions of the body uh, to control uh, motor function. They can be used for sending information about sensory perception about what's going on in the world around them. But in essence, we're sending very rapidly signals within the body. And this is going to be carried out primarily with the neurons. And the neurons are going to be the, the classic cell within the nervous tissue. But it's important to recognize that we're also going to have a special collection of supporting cells. Uh, cells that are going to surround and support the neurons and basically establish an environment where the neurons are capable of surviving and capable of, of functioning properly. And so while most of the attention is going to be on the neurons, it's going to be the supporting cells that play a very vital role in keeping the nervous tissues and the nervous uh, system working properly. So we're going to focus in on the neuron first. And so the cell body of a neuron, uh, because it's uh, a nervous tissue, uh, is given a variety of names. Uh, it could be called the soma, uh, soma for body, or the perikaryon, perikaryon, peri for around carry out uh, for a kernel or basically around the nucleus. And so the cell body uh, of the neuron is that region around the cell nucleus. We take a look at it, the nucleus of most neurons is gonna be relatively large, normally centrally placed and fairly euchromatic with a prominent nucleolus. Again, that's a characteristic we've seen in other cells that are involved with protein synthesis. And we're gonna see that these neuron cells are also going to be involved with a lot of protein synthesis. Uh, if we look out into the cytoplasm, we're going to see very abundant, both free and rough endoplasmic reticulum associated polyribosomes. Uh, and they're going to be clumping together into a basophilic material, which are going to be referred to as missile bodies. And so with the free ribosomes, we're going to be uh, synthesizing proteins. They're going to be used within the cell, uh, such as cytoplasmic proteins. With the rough endoplasmic reticulum, we're going to be producing a lot of proteins that are either going to be embedded within the membrane or secreted from the cell. And so we can see that there's going to be a lot and lot of protein synthesis occurring within these neuronal cells. <clears throat> these cells are also going to have a well-developed Golgi apparatus, often difficult to see in hemotoxin eosin stain section. Uh, but again, this is going to be a characteristic of a cell that's synthesizing and secreting proteins in this case, these neurons are going to be synthesizing and secreting a large number of neurotransmitters. And so producing these neurotransmitters, enzymes to produce the neurotransmitters within membrane-bound structures so that these can be transported within the cell. Now what makes the neuron different from a lot of the other cells we've looked at before is that it's going to have these cytoplasmic extensions. So it's essentially got the cell body, that's some of the perikaryon that we looked at on the previous slide, is going to be sitting in a location, but then it's going to extend, ex kind of processes out, extend kind of it, enlargements of the cytoplasm, branches of the cytoplasm. They're going to go out and essentially allow this neuron to have a much broader impact, to essentially control a much larger region within the body 
in terms of either receiving signals or to be able to carry a signal a great distance. And so the first uh, processes that we're going to look at are going to be the dendrites. And basically the dendrites are almost like branches of a tree reaching out, coming out of the cell body and spreading out. And they're important for increasing the surface area available for an incoming signal. And so these are extensions of the cell body. They're cellular projections. Uh, they lack Golgi complexes, but they may have some small amounts of other organelles that are present. But the thing to keep in mind is that they're, they're part of the, the living cell. They're going to be supported by a cytoskeleton. They're going to have cytoplasm within them. And the cell membrane, the neuronal cell membrane of the cell body, is going to be continuous with the cell membrane of these dendrites. So that if we stimulate this dendrite with some type of incoming signal, we're going to be able to carry that along the neuronal surface. And we'll talk about that later on in, in one of the upcoming mini lectures. It's going to be able to spread across the cell body, make a decision about it, and then decide whether or not we're going to send a signal out along the axon. So the dendrites is kind of three uh, tree-like branching pattern that's going to be coming off of the cell body for receiving signals. We're also going to have axons. Um, most uh, neurons are going to have uh, a, a fairly long axon. Uh, some are going to have short, some actually don't have much of an axon at all. Uh, but the axons in general are going to be, again, an extension of the cell body, so cytoplasmic, a cellular extension, that's going to extend out, and it's going to be focused on carrying impulses or carrying signals away from the cell body. And so if we're thinking about this cell, part of the nervous system, as sending signals within the body, it's going to be the axon that carries that message and provides it to the target cell, whether that target cell is another neuron or a muscle cell or some other uh, gland cell, something like that. We take a look at these axons. Uh, what we're going to see, again, is it's a, a cytoplasmic extension. It's going to be kind of reaching out. Uh, it's going to be continuous with the cell membrane. We're going to have cytoplasm within it, and the cytoplasm is actually going to be called the axoplasm, uh, the, the cytoplasm of the axon. And within that, we're going to have a few organelles. We're going to have some mitochondria, and that's going to be important to recognize because if we're talking about a spinal cord motor neuron, we've got a cell sitting essentially, you know, at the equivalent of, of like your belly region within your spinal cord, and it can send an axon all the way out to the muscles in your toe. And so it could be a, a, a process, a cellular process, that's a meter or more in length. And so it's going to be important that we have the ability to provide ATP, cellular energy, throughout this very long process, especially when we get down to the tip of the axon, where we're going to have some cellular processes going on involved with signaling. And so we're going to have the mitochondria for production of ATP. Within the axon, we're going to have a lot of cytoskeletal elements, primarily neurofilaments and microtubules, again, to provide the structure of the axon, as well as a mechanism to transport materials in an organized way from the cell body down all the way to the tips of the axon, or in some cases from the tip of the axon back to the cell body itself. And so what we're looking at is this concept of what's referred to as axoplasmic transport. And so what we're going to have is within our cytoskeleton, we're going to establish a railroad tracks. And essentially focusing in on the microtubules at this point, they're going to be lined up and organized so that they can run from the, the cell body maybe sitting in the spinal cord up at the kind of belly level of your body, and extend all the way down to your, your toes, to the muscles of your toes, so you can wheel your toes. We're going to have microtubules. They're going to form those railroad tracks along the axoplasm, along the, the, the axon in essence. And then, like we've talked about before with microtubules, is that they provide the railroad tracks, and protein motors are going to interact with the microtubules. And they're either going to march down, these microtubules in one direction, out towards the periphery, out towards your toes, if we're thinking about that. Or they're going to be involved marching from the toes back up to the belly level, back up to the, the motor neuron cell body sitting in the spinal cord. And so if it's marching out to the periphery, this is going to be referred to as anterograde transport. And so we're moving away from the cell body. And it's going to be retrograde, essentially the opposite of that, if it's moving towards the cell body. And so again, what we're looking at is going to be the movement of these molecular proteins along the microtubules, either away from the cell body in an anterograde movement or towards the cell body in a retrograde movement. 
And so if we take a look at this, there's actually a couple different categories of this axoplasmic transport, depending upon what specific proteins are going to be present, what protein motors are going to be present, and what these protein motors are going to be dragging behind them. So again, keep in mind that the little protein motors that are going to be crawling out along the microtubules are like the little locomotives, the, little, the train engines in essence, and they're going to be dragging behind them normally some type of uh, membrane biovesicle or it may be some other elements that are hooked to it. And so we can have fast axoplasmic transport, essentially fast anterograde transport, that can be anywhere from about 10 to 20 centimeters per day. So relatively rapid. And if we take a look at what's involved with that, we're going to see that's a variety of enzymes that are used for synthesis of neurotransmitters. And so synthesis and resynthesis, essentially recycling of the neurotransmitters, because what we want to do is once we get these neurotransmitters in their synaptic vesicles, their membrane valve vesicles that are going to be able to release the, the chemical neurotransmitter from the, the, the cell, from this axon, we want to be able to recycle it so we don't have to continually produce new neurotransmitters and deliver them all the way down this very long axon. We're talking about a spinal cord motor neuron. And so we need to have some enzymes down there that are going to allow us to recycle these neurotransmitters. And regardless of how efficient we are, these enzymes are going to start to break down. And so we need to have a, a ready supply of them, uh, a continuous supply of them. And it's going to be very important to the functioning of the nerve cell that we have those there. So it needs to be able to get there quickly. Other things can be transported more slowly. And so we have a slow axoplasmic transport, again, in that retrograde direction. And what we can see is this may be about one millimeter per day. And these are generally components for growth or components for essentially repair of the, the or maintenance of uh, the cell itself. And so these could be, you know, cytoskeletal elements. It could be membrane proteins. It could be a whole variety of other things like that. That It's important that they get there, but it can take some time for them to get there. Okay, so that's anterograde movement. We can also have retrograde movement. And retrograde movement, again, is from the periphery, you know, the, the tips of your toes, back towards the cell body sitting up in the spinal cord, kind of at the belly level. And what we can see is that we can pick up things and sample things in the environment down there at the muscle cell. And one of the most important things that we can pick up are these molecules called neurotrophic molecules. And they're essentially factors that are released by the target cells, in this case the muscle cells, that keep the axon alive, keep the cell alive. And so it's essentially sending a signal back to the cell body saying everything's working properly, keep doing a good job in essence. Uh, these are also very important in uh, the development of the nervous system. But it's occurring both in development as well as functioning within the adult um, organism. And so we have this mechanism in place then that allows us to be able to transport <clears throat> very rapidly, uh, either through the fast or a little bit slower through the slow uh, axoplasmic transport mechanism, materials that are needed by the tips of these axons. Because diffusion enough isn't going to be sufficient to do it. We need to have an organized mechanism that will allow us to do this. Okay, so that finishes up our, our overview of the nerve cells within the nervous system. In our next mini lecture, we're going to take a look at those support cells. And so this ends uh, part one uh, of the lectures on the nervous system. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thanks.